We're a couple minutes start uh, past our start time, so I'm going to start. So welcome everyone to the final meeting for uh, this season. And now my, okay, well, there we go. We acknowledge that we're meeting on the ancestral lands of several First Nations. We recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon Covenant to this land and offer our respect to our First Nation, Métis and Inuit neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. On May 25th, the remains of 215 children were found on the former Kamloops Indian Reservation, although the school had recorded only 50 deaths. The National Center for Truth and Reconciliation states that about 4,000 deaths of Indian children sent to residential schools recorded in Canada, but the actual number is likely much higher. To celebrate National Indigenous History Month, McLaughlin Library at the University of Guelph has a collection curated by Indigenous initiatives and the Indigenous Student Center at U of G to highlight Indigenous writers, content and research frameworks. It contains a variety of novels, children's literature, research and scholarly texts and memoirs and is well worth exploring um, to uh, inform yourself about Indigenous issues. To find this, Google the University of Guelph Library Curated Indigenous Collection. Nature Guelph connects people with nature and inspires them to celebrate and protect it. We do this through education and action, through our speaker series, our conservation projects and citizen science. Your membership matters and your memberships will be coming due in September again, as we are a volunteer led uh, run registered charity or membership fees pay for our activities. More importantly, each individual member adds to a collective voice for nature. So together we have greater impact with our advocacy efforts. You can also generate through uh, donate to Nature Guelph through Canada Helps, through our general fund, our youth education fund, or our conservation, conservation and land stewardship fund. I'm going to welcome members, friends, family, and visitors. This event, like all Nature Guelph events, is free, but donations are always welcome if you're not members. You can donate online to Nature Guelph um, or through Canada Helps. I'm going to give a special welcome to Waterloo Region Nature the Huron Fringe Field Naturalists, Soggy Nature, and the Two Rivers Festival 2021, who are all joining this presentation today. We still are looking for a few volunteers to help out with Nature Guelph, a website programmer, Nature Guelph Birdwing is looking for speakers and outing leaders, and we are looking for a new membership chair. For activities, when uh, we have no planned activities right now, but the Two Rivers Festival is continuing on. They have a lot of festivals in Guelph, many of them outdoors, some of them on Zoom, and uh, you can check out their website for the current calendar of events. You can also revisit some of the activities we did this year on Nature Guelph's YouTube channel, which is up and running now. So you can search YouTube for Nature Guelph and you'll find quite a few of the presentations that we did last year. We'd also invite you to share your photos using the Guelph Nature Community Facebook page uh, to share your nature photos, videos, and sightings. And now I'm going to ask you to mute your microphones, turn off your videos, and uh, we're ready for our presentation. I'll ask you to post your questions to chat and we'll answer questions at the end. I'm pleased to introduce Peter Tom, who has been a naturalist all his life. Since retiring in 20. 10, he has dedicated a considerable amount of his time to projects related to wildlife and natural areas. He volunteers on numerous projects at the Royal Botanical Gardens, including spearheading a multi-year bird population study. He has volunteered many hours and days at bird observatories in Ontario and Central Asia, and has spent volunteer time in both Kenya and Uganda on wildlife survey work. In late 2016, he took on the role of speaker ambassador for the Owl, Owl Foundation. So I'm going to invite uh, Peter to do his presentation. 
Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to share screen and where is it? Hmm. Bear with me, folks. I mean, we got to uh, acknowledge that this always happens, right? Well, there's You'll me. You'll have to have it in an active window um, on your desktop and then uh, choose it after you select share screen. Okay. Well, I'm just wondering after we looked at it a moment ago, maybe we shut it down. So let's just reopen it. There it is. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Good. Well, thank you. Sorry. And um, as I say, I guess it's inevitable. You know, these things never work smoothly, just best laid plans of mice and men. But uh, thank you for that introduction and good evening, everybody. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to, to present to you, to tell you about owls and really in the context of the Owl Foundation. And I'd like to make a special thanks and welcome to, to these various other naturalist clubs who have joined in with Guelph, I really, that's a great idea. So it's nice to know that uh, I'm talking to, to, uh, to a wider audience. So it's really great. So um, this, this first slide here is just a, a screenshot from a movie made many years ago, years ago about Kay McKeever. And I think many of you will recognize the name Kay McKeever. She was the lady that founded the Owl Foundation. And sadly, she died just two years ago. She was a wonderful lady. And I have seen, on a couple of occasions, I've seen Kay do a presentation uh, about her work on the Owl Foundation. And she was one of the most engaging speakers. Of course, she knew her subject inside out. And she had a very warm personality. She was just a, a treat to deal with. I can't really hope to sort of match Kay's competency at this, but I've taken on the job of presenting for the Owl Foundation and happily and willingly do it. So as I said, it's going to be about owls and really in the context of the Owl Foundation. And so I don't suppose many of you will recognize this piece of geography here, but a few of you may. This is uh, a service road. Um, I'm hoping you can see, yes, my cursor there. This sloping thing on the left here is this piece of the Skyway Bridge, which is the, the bridge that takes you over the, the canal that leads into Hamilton Harbour. So this is a service road that comes along beside it. And right here, one July, sorry, one January 1st day, an OPP officer picked up uh, a snowy owl. It was at the side of the road and it was injured. <laughs> I can't help thinking, you think on January the 1st, an OPP officer would have better things to do than pick up owls, but maybe the parties were over and things were getting quiet. Anyway, he picked up this owl. Uh, I don't know whether picking up owls is included in police training. Anyway, he took it to the uh, animal control place in Burlington. They wisely got in touch with the Owl Foundation. The Owl Foundation called me because I live really not very far from that point, and I went to the the animal control and found the owl and it was in a cardboard box. So I took it up to the owl foundation and they had an on duty um, zoologist there and she picked it up and said, hmm, it's been on the ground for a while, looking a little bit worse for wear and the lice are starting to make themselves at home. And then she opened, spread out its wings in part of her examination. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping, somebody yell if you cannot see my cursor. I'm assuming you can. So when we opened up this owl's wing, and this clearly is not the wing, there was a chunk of the wing missing, roughly semicircular, like this, right out of, out of the secondary feathers. And <laughs> It was a mystery, but not only were they missing, they were singed around the edges. And what we think had happened 
was the, the owl had flown from the lake, which is over to the right on this picture, trying to get to Hamilton Harbour, which is over on the left side of the picture, and flew over these two um, flares. This is where they burn off the excess gas from the sewage treatment plant here. So you can imagine the owl flying over like this, gets right over these flares and completely loses all ability to fly and crashes down there. So it's a pretty sad story. And uh, the upshot of it was she, she treated as best she could. She put it into, um, into one of their IC, well, intensive care units, but it died a couple of days later. And I would just add at this point that about something better than 50% of the owls <clears throat> that are taken to the Owl Foundation are sufficiently restored to go back to where they were found and released. Well, that was my first real in-your-face engagement with the Owl Foundation, but not long after that, I got a call from them and they asked me to go to a golf course. Now, it's not this golf course. I just picked that picture out of the internet because it's got a nice name. But the story was, and it must have been about this time of year, Owl Foundation had a call from a, um, a vet uh, in central southern Ontario who said um, clients of mine have got an owl can you do anything with it and apparently the uh, the work the maintenance crew at a golf course had found a young great horned owl on the ground and they picked it up and um, just didn't know what to do with it um, I think you can you can sympathize, you know. I mean, you're you're on a maintenance crew in a golf course and you find an owl on the ground and owl, mate, owl care and, and attention is really not part of your job description. What are you going to do with it? You can't throw it up in the air and hope that it flies back to its nest. So they fretted for a while and they called around and one guy, apparently when I met these guys, they, I mean, the whole work screw, maintenance crew came out to see me when I came to pick up this owl. And one guy looked at me and he said, you know, I was going to take this home and uh, we're going to look after it and, I, and we're going to, you know, look after it and nurse it back to health and uh, re-release it. I called my wife and said this and she said, no, we're not. So he didn't. And uh, I picked up this owl and took it back to the Owl Foundation. And that is it. And it's a young great horned owl. And you can see coming in top left there, some of the some of the contour feathers are starting to grow in. I think the zoologist at the Owl Foundation gave it a, an age. I think she said about, I'm not sure whether this even sounds right, 12 days, 12 to 15 days. Yeah, maybe. Anyway, they said, oh yeah, it's a young great horned owl, let's say about 12 days old. We'll put it in with big red. So they had this bird, Big Red. She was a mature, unable to fly, uh, great horned owl. They'd had her for a number of years. And every year when they got people come in with a couple of, with an orphaned great horned owl, they put it in with great, with Big Red. And every year she would foster them. And she was just reliable. It was important that Big Red had started, her, it had come into I don't want, what am I trying to say here? She had started a breeding cycle. She, the hormones had kicked in. So she was receptive to taking on youngsters, even though she wasn't mated. And I think she may have laid the odd egg, but she, she didn't have a mate, but she was quite happy to take on youngsters. And year after year, she'd just graduate a class of, of, uh, of orphans. So she's a great asset. Sadly, she died last year. I think she was fairly old. I think she was 18 or 20 years old and finally burned out. And that was the end of Big Red. I think they have now got another foster mum. Now, I'm just going to go off on a bit of a tangent here because I, I stumbled upon something <clears throat> not, well, a couple of years ago that I just like, I like to share with birder groups. And sort of the, the entree, the segue into this is, the caption at the top there, the class of 2019. And I want to make the point that we associate, maybe we don't, but the world associates, much of the world anyway, associates owls with wisdom and education. 
and the going back to school thing. I mean, this is a, you see this sort of motif everywhere. Well, I want to share with you that your Senate, the Senate of Canada, thinks that owls are pretty cool too. And somewhere, somebody must have said, listen, senators, we're, we're, we're not doing a very good job of communicating with the public. And least of all, we, we're not communicating with the young people in this country. So I think, you know, money is unlimited. We are the Senate. Senate. So let's commission somebody to write a storybook about owls and explain to the young people in this country about owls and wisdom and the value of the Senate. So they did. They made this uh, storybook and it's been beautifully illustrated. And even though I am a uh, an immigrant, I'm a Brit, and you'd think I'd have a little bit of sympathy in a way for this. I find this actually a rather patronizing book because it sets up the story here. I won't read it word for word, but what it's doing is it's saying on the left here is Canada, lots of wood to cut down and beavers and bears. And on the right, on the other side of the pond is Her Majesty the Queen or the British Crown over looking across, making sure that things are staying in order. And it goes on to say that the poor, poor Canadians really didn't know quite what to do. So they tried to sort out a way of, of managing themselves. I'll leave it to you to read the text. And eventually, they didn't know, really quite know what to do. But you'll notice there are owls looking on. So what they did, they took the advice of an owl. I guess I do have to read this now. And so the shaggy bear rose to her feet. I would feel better if the owl kept an eye on the council of animals, she said. You get the parallel? I'm sure you do. So, they, so now we've got the owl is a um, metaphor for the Senate. That's it. So they produced this children's book that pulls together very tenuously the wisdom of owls with your Senate. And there you are, folks. There's four of them. And that, by the way, is Mike Tuffy, bottom left. Anyway, enough about wisdom. We're going to shift gears. And, you know, as I was reviewing this this morning, I thought the winter of 2013, 14, yes, I remember it well, but man, that's getting to be quite a quite a while ago now. It's only what eight eight years ago, but that was, I'm sure you remember it, and we all remember it, that it was a bitterly cold winter. <clears throat> it had some very interesting outcomes. It became, I won't say it was known as the winter of the snowy owl, but it was a winter <clears throat> in which there was a big, excuse me. <clears throat> a big influx of snowy owls. And this is somewhat illustrative. This is uh, obviously a satellite shot. That's Toronto Harbour there. Down the bottom left here is Hamilton Harbour, so Guelph would be back up, up here somewhere. But this is a shot, obviously, of showing Lake, Lake Ontario. Uh, this may be largely ice. Well, I remember it. There was a lot of ice on Lake Ontario. But <clears throat> more importantly, there was even more ice on Lake Erie. <clears throat> and, well, there you go. That's a screenshot. That's a shot of Lake Erie in that winter 2014. And that, by comparison, is just a couple of years ago. You know, that's, that was a tough winter. Well, one of the outcomes of that <clears throat> was that we got this big influx of owls. It was all triggered by uh, a boom in the lemming population in the high Arctic. And when there was a superabundance of lemmings, the various nesting snowy owls in the Arctic were able to successfully read, breed, raise more young than usual. And so during 2013, uh, there was a boom in the population of the snowy owls in the Arctic, which is fine until 2013 drew to a close. Winter started moving in and then there was really not enough food around for all of the snowy owls. So that started pushing the, the owls south. And that, by the way, appears to be at least one of the explanations for why we get these periodic eruptions of snowy owls 
every few winters. But that particular winter, the polar vortex winter, was a really big, presented a really big push of snowy owls. And this is just a screenshot from Facebook from that date. Uh, just sightings of snowy owls. It's, I said Facebook, I mean eBird. Um, anybody that uses eBird will know that these are not necessarily all different, different owls. I mean, that could be just one owl and four or five reports of it. But still and all, that's a lot of snowy owls pushed down in that winter. And that compares then just going back a couple of years. So you know, that year as against that year. So definitely there was a lot, and that was noted right across the country, right across the, the, the continent. And you'll notice there was even a sighting in Bermuda and one down here in Florida, in Jacksonville, Florida. So big year for snowy owls. And what that suddenly meant was that there was an opportunity to do some research. And a number of ornithologists in New England, basically New Jersey, um, Pennsylvania area started thinking about how they could take advantage of this influx of snowy owls and, and do some research. It was a happy conjunction of technology and this eruption of snowy owls. They started a project called Project Snowstorm. And I'm going to hope to remind you of that name later on because there still is lots of work going on under the name of Project Snowstorm and they do a very excellent blog. So what they realized, one, one of the tasks was to stop the snowy owls uh, from hanging around in airports with all the uh, problems that we're all too familiar with. And what they realized was what they could actually do now with, with latest de developments in technology is they could put trackers on these owls. So when they capture an owl from an airport, they could move it off, take it 100 miles away, and then they could track where it is, and they'd even know if it comes back. And from that realization came a little bit more. They thought, well, we can track owls around airports. We can do a bit more than that. We can track them as they're flying around. We will get to know how far they wander and when. And there's a big, obviously just a big research project. So they trapped a number of owls, they put trackers on them and started to learn a lot of things. And one of the things they learned was, was really key. Now, I think my, recollect, right, my recollection as a birder was that historically, you know, you'd see snowy owls in the odd snowy owl in January or December, January, and then eventually they'd be gone and everybody would say, oh, they must have pushed further south. The truth of it was that as the winters closed in, now that they had these tracking devices on the owls, they realized that the owls weren't going further south, but they were going out on the lake because the lakes were freezing over, particularly this vortex winter, polar vortex winter. The owls were going out on the lakes. They just find themselves a, a nice, chunk of ice somewhere, an iceberg, and they'd sit there and pick off the ducks because um, the Great Lakes, the lower Great Lakes are quite a place for uh, overwintering ducks. Um, I mean, what could be more obvious than, I mean, the middle of Lake Ontario, ice bound, would very much resemble the Arctic. Um, it's not like they're looking for trees or warm places to, to, to shelter, as long as they can just find a, somewhere reasonably with some reasonable viewpoint and just pick off ducks. And that was a revelation that they weren't, they weren't going further south. They were hanging around and they were helping themselves to the ducks out on the ice. Well, that was a revelation in itself, but then things started to, to improve because they realized they could follow these owls as the winter started to come to an end. So here's one here. Um, you can see it's in February, March, and it's starting to be time for that owl to head north again. And they were able to track it as it went. And 
I should just interject here that those tracking units they put on them, those satellite trackers, um, they, I think they're solar powered. And as they cross or come anywhere near a cell tower, they download the information. And that's fine as long as there are cell towers around. But well, sooner or later, those birds are going to fly north and they're going to be out of range of a cell phone tower. Well, that sounds like an insurmountable problem, but if those birds should ever come back within range of a tower, then all that information would be downloaded again. To make sure that there's only, you know, safe and effective products available. Then in the province, the Ministry of the Environment and Conservation of Parks will cl classify the pesticides under the Pesticides Act. Um, I'm picking and, up uh, something else here. Their uh, Pesticides Act says products must be used. I think Sheena's listening. Sheena should be on mute. Um, I'd like to hear from somebody if you can hear me okay now. Can hear you fine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so carrying on. So what they found was they got these trackers on them and all this is kind of evolving in front of them. And that bird there, Buckeye, as it started to, to head north, um, was a little bit puzzling. But then they found that the tracker tracked it all the way back. So up in the top left there, it says the 14th of July in 2015, or the 15th of anyway, July, of some year and that that northbound track came back to them when Bucky, Buckeye came within cell phone range. Well just going back to the point I made a moment ago this is all kind of evolving in front of them it starts out from what, what are we going to do about these birds that are in, inhabiting airports and what, what can we do with the information that we're now tracking and what is this information showing us and it's showing them a ton of stuff. And uh, the whole um, project now is, is adding immeasurably to the amount of knowledge known about uh, snowy owls and their migration patterns and where they go and survivorship and that sort of stuff. So the project Snowstorm has expanded its range because of its capabilities. It really, monitors a lot of birds around our part of Ontario, particularly eastern Ontario and in, into Quebec as well. But you, I mean, this is self-evident. You can see what, what sort of information is being returned. For example, look at that. I mean, this is incredible. Without those satellite trackers, how would they ever know that? I mean, it's got bird banding beat by a long way, I would say. And that, I just downloaded this or took this from the Snow, Operation Snowstorm um, blog a, a couple of months ago. I mean, this is a whole aggregation of track tracking that's been done in the last few years. Just astonishing stuff. And it gets even more detailed. Um, it says it at the top there, this, from the massive amount of information, this is just tracking one bird and it's just revealing that probably its nest site is that big spot in the middle and those other big big clusters around it. This, this is probably the nest site. These other spaces are probably places where this bird sits and watches over the nest. Perhaps Redwood is a male and he's just keeping an eye on the female. I'm not female and the young, I'm not sure. but. I mean, all of this from the miniaturization of the satellite trackers. And when we come to the Q&A session later on, I would really, if anybody knows more about satellite tracking and the technology involved, I'd love it if they could chime in on this because it's, it's all new to me. So change of pace again, this goes back a little further. And I think many of you will remember this I'm going to stop talking, let you read. And I do remember that winter and I saw that 
much as I don't, I, I usually don't chase birds, but I did go to Oshawa to see that bird. So they were, they were around just as, I mean, the snowy owls were much more frequently encountered than the great greys. But this takes us into the realm now of the Owl Foundation. And it was, as I, I said at the outset, the founder was uh, Kay McKeever. Uh, Larry was her second husband. And the two of them, Kay started, uh, Kay had a big heart and she, she would rescue or try to rehabilitate, rehabilitate any animal, any vertebrate she, that somebody brought to her, she would try to rescue, rehabilitate it. And, she, and that was when she lived in Peterborough in the uh, late 60s and 70s, I think. But she kind of graduated. She went from any vertebrate to birds, from any birds to uh, raptors, from any raptors to owls, and became the acknowledged expert in owl rehabilitation and rescue and, and so on. And this is inside the house. Some of you may have been to the house in Vineland. And she had a number of cages inside the house. And she would take owls from anywhere in North America and keep them in these little cages really became unfeasible after a while. If you have been there, you might be familiar that they have a lovely, lovely old house on the banks of a valley and they built a number of these flight pens around the place. Some of them are in desperate need of restoration, but that's all going ahead. The Owl Foundation is, is secure in its ability to keep restoring and repairing and, and maintaining facilities. I, now this is a bit of a, okay. Sorry, so a bit of a jarring change. I want to just talk about some of the people that, some of the animals that have found their way to the Owl Foundation. I took, I, I, I took this shot. This is actually of very little relevance to the Owl Foundation. I took this shot because just there it was right in front of me. That's the Ikea parking lot in Burlington. And I expect some of you have been there. And all this picture really says to me is there's dad holding the Christmas tree. The kids, of course, are sitting in the car doing nothing, just waiting for the parents to do the hard work. And mum and dad are going to load that Christmas tree into the car, take it home, unwrap it. The Owl Foundation got a call one day because somebody had done exactly that. And when they unwrapped their Christmas tree in the middle of it, there was a screech owl. And they were asked to come and intervene. So they went to the house and they captured the screech owl, screech owl took it back and re probably rehydrated it, got it back into decent condition. It, she said it was, it was healthy, it was fine. But Lord knows where it came from, probably New Brunswick. I, I just don't know. But anyway, they rehabilitated it and in due course let it go. They tell another funny story. Um, this, I just pictured this, took this picture out off the internet. It's just somebody's log cabin, and the only that's that's really not relevant, except that on the left here you can see the flue from an indoor. Uh, wood, wood stove. And the story went that a bunch of hunters went to sometime, I think it was probably November, they went to their hunt camp and came in out of the snow and went into their hunt camp. And one of the guys, you know, you can imagine it's a bunch of guys bringing in their cases of beer and all their sleeping bags and so on. And one, some, one guy says, okay, I'll get a fire going. So he went over to the um, went over to the wood burning stove, he opened it up and he stuck some newspaper in it and set light to it and out flew a screech owl. So the screech owl had found its way in through one of these flues, got its all the way down, got its way down here and found a nice cozy place in a, in a, a, a stove inside the, inside the, the cabin. It coz, too cozy after a while when they lit a fire. Anyway, so they got hold of this poor bird and they took it down to the Owl Foundation and the Owl Foundation was able to bring it, nurse it back to health. It was pretty singed and had lost a lot of flight feathers, but uh, they kept it long enough. They couldn't just nurse it back to health and let it go. They had to wait until it went through the right molt sequence and replaced 
those flight feathers that have been lost. And flight feathers, of course, would be those, uh, the primaries and secondaries in the wing, and of course, the tail feathers. And it took a couple of years, I think, before the feathers actually started to, to come back. As far as I know, it's got a happy ending. They do have some captive owls. Any owls that are captive, uh, unless they're new young offspring, are unable to fly. So these great greys have been with them for 10 or 15 years. They're unable to fly. I think they have produced young. Oh yeah, I hope there's evidence. And then when, so when an owl comes in, often, um, I mean, they give it, they give it all the care and attention it needs. And sometimes they'll x-ray it to see if there's any damage. I got this x-ray from this image from the Owl Foundation. They couldn't see anything wrong with that, uh, nor could I, not that I'm an expert. Maybe we've got some vets in the audience tonight. We couldn't see anything wrong with that, but we certainly could with that. That's a, got a shotgun pellet in the abdomen of that owl. And there's quite often a lot of work to be done. Very often when uh, birds are in collisions with um, vehicles, the damage is to the head, uh, but frequently enough also to the wings, and you, you can understand why. That, I don't know whether anybody would consider that to be a clean break, um, but I'm sure that one is not. But they do have some vets uh, who volunteer their time and will actually do work on, on a bird to help rehabilitate it. And I'm not an expert here. I imagine there's some people are oh, no know more about it than I, but this rod is going in here to, to uh, strengthen this break here. And once things have knitted, then I gather they clip off the bits that are stuck out and end up just with this steel shaft in here to, to strengthen, uh, strengthen the wing. I was groping there for the name of the bone, but lost it. So as the birds come in, uh, they're assessed by one of the zoologists. Note the gloves she's wearing, this great horned owl. And they weigh them and examine them. They always inspect their eyes and their ears because that's very often where they'll spot damage. And they'll make an assessment as to whether the bird is, is a hopeless case or can be uh, restored. This would be one of the volunteer vets. And we're looking in here into the, the ear, ear the, um, yeah, the ear opening, which is just behind the eye, an enormous ear canal. That blue thing there is the back of the eyeball. And now we're just a bunch of pictures that I got from the Owl Foundation of some of their patients from over the years. Notice the mouse at this guy's foot. This is their intensive care unit. When an owl comes in, it very often needs at least one or two days of being, of being kept quiet. Uh, they probably do some rehydration, some sort of basic treatments. They call that triage, just doing what needs to be done right now, <clears throat> and then put them somewhere quiet to get them stable before they take the next steps. Then they will eventually, all things being good, they will move out to the flight pens. Um, that obviously would be sort of the last stage in their, in their uh, recovery. And then in the flight pens, which are varying sizes, and some of them are really very spacious because there's a lot of uh, <clears throat> fl flight restoration to be done. But every day, every owl is checked and every owl is fed. Of and the food is put into through this slot on the left here. This is Stacy, one of the zoologists, doing her, her daily check. This, this is one of their newer flight um, pen arrangements. This can be reconfigured inside to remove various uh, barriers. So actually an owl can fly from end to end and actually across and end to end in there if, if there's sufficient room. By that, I mean, if there's, you know, there's not too many other residents. So when they put the food in, it isn't always 
uh, taken immediately, but they usually grab it and then hang on to it for later. And now again, just a number of pictures of some of their patients. They don't need introduction from me, I think. I, well, I'll give you, uh, no, you know what? Uh, when a little later, we'll, we'll have lots of pictures for owls. They'll all be labeled. So I won't just, uh, I'll, I'll comment from time to time. Oh yes, I, this was a barred owl. I watched this one. He had just come from a, a smaller pen indoors and they've moved him to this outdoor flight pen. This is one of my own shots. Most of them is not my shots, but this was one that I took and he just flew straight to that perch there. And while I looked at him and just basically said, oh, that's a lovely old, lovely little barred owl. They were watching him very carefully. They were watching to see that he, how he stirred, uh, how he reacted to other sounds, to see if things were symmetrical. And I mean, they were really evaluating him, but he was fine. Couple of couple of long-eared owls in there, I think. <clears throat> Certainly a long-eared owl there. Northern hawk owl. Long ear. Young saw wet. I said I wouldn't. <clears throat> said I wouldn't comment on it. <clears throat> Yeah, barn owls, uh, the ornithologists amongst us will know that barn owls are almost never seen in Ontario. But they did get one not long ago. It was down, it was in Grimsby, and they went out and picked it up. And uh, whatever was wrong with it, they restored it and, and re it recovered and they set it free. They do have, or they did have, a couple of barn owls in, um, in residence, unable to, to be returned to the wild. These are them, and one of the, the reason that barn owls are so rare in Ontario is our winter is just too cold for them, and their feet are very susceptible to freezing, and in an Ontario winter, they've, they've, their feet would be damaged, so, that, so they are just a bird of slightly more temperate climates. So the one or two that they do have in the Owl Foundation, they have these special roosting boxes for them. And in the lower half of this is a, you know, a 60 watt light bulb, keeping it just warm enough that its feet don't freeze. Yeah, so they do have two snowy owls, uh, a male and a female, unable to be returned to the wild, but they breed every year and produce a clutch of young. And that's what they look like when they're little and tiny. But they grow up to be quite handsome. And the birders amongst us will know that the males are usually virtually pure white. And the females have a bit more brown and black flecking on them. So um, you can see how that gets started, all sooty. And then uh, they become barred like that. And then, as I say, if an adult male will lose almost all of those black marks and you'll be pure white. And those snowy owls are taken back up north, I think, to, they were going back to northern Manitoba. I'm not sure they are anymore. Go up to, used to go to Churchill. Now I'm not sure where they go now, but they're flown up there. We've got, they've got a couple of volunteer pilots who find room for them that take them back up, take them back north. <clears throat> where they are released. And that, of course, is what the Owl Foundation wants to see. As I said earlier, better than 50% of their patients do get released uh, back <clears throat> where possible, where they came from. <clears throat> this is that Grimsby barn owl being released. And I had the pleasure of doing a release myself uh, 18 months ago, and I was given a barred owl to take back up to Richmond Hill area. And I went up there one January day with a, a young exchange student from Estonia. And it was, it was quite epic. Yeah, that's it. So there's me letting this barred owl go. There's a young exchange student from Estonia. I mean, 
You know, if you if you went on youth exchange to another country, I think one of the last things you'd ever think you'd be doing is going to watch an owl be released, let alone see an owl. Uh, that was a lovely experience. It was, of course, bitterly cold. And the interesting thing is you see that car at top left just coming over the crest of the hill. We let that owl go. It flew up to the trees on the right and perched on a branch and looked at us. That car pulled to a halt. Whole family piled out. They came over and they said, what, what, did, 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 did you, what were you doing? Was that a bird in there? And we showed them the owl and they were absolutely dumbfounded. They could hardly speak. It was a great experience for everybody, especially for the owl. <clears throat> so I'm sort of going to stop here. Um, what happens now is there's a, there's a whole lot more photographs to come. They're all on timers. So each subsequent picture lasts about 10 seconds. But I think what we do now is, is we use this as a Q&A sessions. Um, and I will answer to the, to the extent that I can. I really welcome anybody else to chime in to answer those questions and to correct me where I've made mistakes. I am not an owl expert. I'm a birder and I spend a lot of time out in the field, but there is a lot about owls that I don't know. I've learned a lot from the Owl Foundation, but uh, I'd love your input, questions, corrections, challenges. Uh, over to you. So we have a couple questions and I'm sure more will be coming into the chat. So I have a question. The One of the first slides you showed showed a 12 year old or a 12 day old owl that had been injured. And I noticed it at unequal pupil sizes that the, each eye had, a, one eye had a smaller pupil than the other. And do you know, was that a result of the injury or uh, can that, owls actually control the pupils of each eye independently? Yeah, I don't know the answer to the second, ha second part of the question. That owl wasn't injured. It probably had just four, well, if falling out of the nest is not injured. So it was just a, probably an owl that had crawled, was misadventure and fallen to the ground. Um, so I don't think there was any injury there. I think that's just, maybe that's a part of being an immature. So I, I don't think I can answer it very well. So, sorry. Okay, so I'll invite anyone who has a question. You can, uh, actually, we're not that big a crowd. You can unmute yourself and ask your question, or you can type your question into the chat and I will read it for Peter. Yeah, if I could just interject, one thing I didn't mention that I should have done, um, <clears throat> a question that I'm often asked uh, is, can I go to the Owl Foundation, can I go and see the owls? And the answer is, no, you can't, but yes, you can. It's, it is not a zoo, so you can't just go there, walk in, pay an admission and, and walk around and see the owls. But for anybody that makes a donation to the Owl Foundation of $50 or more, they will get an invitation to their open house. And they have an open house every year, not uh, except COVID years. They have an open house for two or three weekends in a row in September. So make a $50 donation and you get a guided tour. You'll see lots of owls. Questions? So we have a question now. Uh, we have a question asking how many owls and what species does the foundation release each year? Uh, they, they get, uh, it varies of course, they get between 100 and 200 a year in intakes and about better than 50% of them uh, are released back to where they came from. Um, there'd be a fairly large mortality in that other half and those that can't be released but are otherwise healthy, they sometimes donate them to uh, places with wildlife affiliations like Mountsburg or perhaps a zoo or something like that. Um, does that answer? I think I missed part of that. I think, that's, and that's, uh, yeah, they were wondering how many owls and what species were released. So I guess if they get 200 well, in, they must release 100. Yeah. Um, so to try to, to narrow in on the species, it would have to be anything anything that's an Ontario bird. It used to be that the Owl Foundation was taking birds from across the continent. 
Um, then the, the US Canada border became very difficult for moving wildlife, wildlife. So then they just restricted to Canadian birds. And then the borders with Quebec and Manitoba became even more difficult. So now they just said, okay, just Ontario birds. So really you're, the answer lies in any owl species that you find in Ontario, they would get it at the Owl Foundation. And someone is asking, where is the building that was shown? I think they were talking about that uh, building with the two sides, uh, each for flying and the connecting corridor. Oh yeah, that's at the Owl Foundation. Uh, they have a fairly large piece of land on the edge of a, of a valley as a, a river down the bottom. And then they've got a lot of table land on top and 30 or 40 acres. And that building is part of a, one of the many flight pens that they have. And I was just talking the other day to the, actually to Kay McKeever's son, and they're going to rebuild, totally rebuild. The, the flight pens where they keep the snowy owls need to be completely re rebuilt. And there is no getting around it. It has to be done because uh, the wood has rotted. They can't use pressure treated wood. Uh, and when the wood rots, uh, it allows uh, the screening, they have to have fine screening to keep out the mosquitoes that carry West Nile virus because West Nile virus infects owls. Um, so it's just become untenable for as an owl pen. So they got to pull the whole thing down and rebuild it with a new pen. And of course, one of the big issues is the current price of lumber, but it's got to be done and they will do it. So uh, we have another question. Are there any owls in Ontario banded? Yes, uh, every owl that c goes through the Owl Foundation does get banded. And I know at least one uh, bird observation station that does ban sore wet owls. Um, I imagine others do too, I, I bet Long Point does. So yes, owls are banded. Uh, I, is, I wonder if David Brewer is in the audience tonight. He surely would be able to answer that. Do you, uh, do you know where they ban them? At the reg, reg, regular stations or is it only at the Owl Foundation? Well, they ban them at the Owl Foundation as and when they treat them and about to release them. But at regular stations, regular bird observatories, uh, they do, do uh, net them. They, I, I know of one place where they, uh, they banned saw wet owls. They get them in October, November. Uh, catch them on the, when they're on their migration, their full That's migration. That's Edward Point. Uh, okay, so I'm also talking about uh, Ruthven Park. So Prince Edward is... Point does banding of saw wits every October. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, my name's Eileen Hodson. Um, I've met Kay McKeever many, many times over the years. Uh, what an outstanding, wonderful woman. And it was she's so a better sad. speaker than me, isn't she? It was. Oh, she's amazing. <laughs> it was so sad uh, for her passing. But uh, I certainly hope her her house stays the sa is is intact the same. I hope her her hard hat is still outside her her office door that we used to have to put on uh, before we went in to visit her because her overprotective owls would attack you. Um, uh, because they'd be so protective of K, and I hope the sign is still on the upside of the toilet seat after you use this bathroom. Please put the toilet seat down because owls cannot swim. I loved her place. It was just one of the most magnificent places to be, and I hope it's it, they've kind of kept it as a time capsule of I, what Eileen, it was like when K was there. Eileen, I think you would you would definitely know it if you walked in it today. I suspect they don't need the sign on the toilet lid anymore. And perhaps her hard hat's not there, but oh. otherwise, yeah, it's still Kay's place. Well, she had she had her blind owls and out like her owls lived with her. Um, Big bird. You know, we'd be yes, we'd be sitting in the in the living room and the yeah. owls be she had a cat too that you know the owls yeah. would just hop around on the back of the cat and and you know the the owls just lived in the living room with us, and it That's was. That's right. I'd always bring her like a fruit flan, and 
it was so amazing. It was the most amazing place. And the part that made my heart sing the most was out, uh, Kay did not get into becoming an owl expert until she was later in life. Um, <clears throat> you know, it was not like she had studied at university no. uh, as a young student to become this person. This was a passion of hers. And, uh, you know, I've read all of her books and the idea of her driving down the 401 with all the escaped mice crawling all over her <laughs> as passengers are driving by when she would go and get, uh, you know, the mice for the mouse house. Um, you know, I could just see it, you know, this, she was such an amazing woman and I'm so happy that her legacy has living on. Well, thanks Thank for you. sharing that, Eileen. Thank yeah. you. We, uh, we have a question that's very, um, pertinent to that. And this question is, did Kay McIver leave her property and facilities to the Owl Foundation? And uh, the uh, auxiliary to that is, how is the foundation supported? Um, yes, she did. The, the property, well, her son, Rod, uh, basically manages the Owl Foundation now. He's there virtually every day, so he's continuing it on. It, Essentially, it's the McKeever property, and uh, it's it's still there, and it and it, it will endure. Uh, how does it do financially? I think it's secure. I should I can say that um, it does quite well for donations, and I think it's on, it's on stable footing. Thank you. So we have another owl question, which you will hope you can try for the answer for us. Someone is asking, what is the average lifespan of an owl? Well, I wish somebody else could chime in on that. I, I would, I, you know, the answer is it depends, doesn't it? But it depends on the, on the type of the bigger owls, I guess, last longer. I think in captivity, things like great horned owls might go 30 years, but I'll bet you in the wild, they'd be lucky to go 10. And then if you go to the small end of the spectrum, I would think a screech owl might be good for 10 in captivity and three in the wild, but I would welcome anybody else's thoughts on that because I think it's sort of anybody's guess. Okay, thank you. And uh, we're asking, what is the average number of owls being held in the foundation at any one time? Mm, basically don't know, but if they're taking in, they're taking in somewhere between 100 and 200 a year. I would guess, I would guess they must have at any one time 30 or 40 owls. How many, yeah. how many uh, pens or cages do they have for them? That, that would be about that number? Uh, yes, um, I've, I've been around it many times. It's sometimes hard to tell where one begins, one stops, another one begins, but there's, I mean, there's, there's flight pens and there's much smaller pens, depending on the abilities of the owl and the stage of its recuperation. Um, but I would think there's probably 20 facilities, there's probably 20 or 30, let's call them pens of one size or another. Okay, thanks. And uh, Rick uh, is reporting that Simcoe County Banders near Barrie, they ban lots of owls and hawks in two different sites every year and they have a Facebook page. So you might want to check out the Simcoe County Banders to see okay. the owls that they've banded. Um, we have someone saying that they saw a TV Ontario program uh, years ago about the foundation. And they were wondering, has Kay received any awards like Order of Canada um, from the province or the federal government recognizing her work? Um, don't know, but I think so. I think she got some recognition from the province, but I, sorry, I can't answer that. I, I mean, I've, I, anybody who's got her book, it might be on the, on the cover, but I don't have that information at hand, sorry. So I, I'm coming to the end of the written questions. Is anybody else putting questions into, oh, John is saying that he believes she did have Order of Canada. Uh, are there any more questions or comments or can we help out Peter and his uh, about what what he does and does not know about owls? And I'm not seeing any more questions. So thank you very much, uh, Peter. 
It was uh, an excellent presentation and very interesting to see all those uh, eruptions of owls and, uh, and that slideshow at the end where we could see all the different kinds with their names to help us out with our identification skills. And uh, I'll remind everybody that if uh, for the small price of $50, you can uh, get invited to tour the Owl Foundation uh, property. And that might be a very interesting thing too. I see Larry Hubble is with us this evening. Hi, Larry. Okay, so. Uh, can I add something, Judy? Sorry yeah, to interrupt, yeah, before yeah. one goes. If you search for K. McKeever's obituary online, have a read it. I mean, it's just a fascinating summary of what she's done. Um, what an amazing woman. I, I met her a couple of times too. And wow, was very touched by the experience of meeting uh, her owls in her living room and everything. And uh, she was extraordinary. And her life with Larry was amazing. And in here and toward the end, it does talk about that she basically won so many awards. They can't even be listed here. There's just so many from rehabilitation, veterinary, conservation, and other organizations. But uh, they listed a couple here. They both received, uh, both Kay and Larry received honorary Doctor of Laws degrees. Kay received the Lifetime Achievement Award of the U.S. National Wildlife Rehabbers Association. And she was made an, a member of the Order of Canada in 1986. Well, thanks for that, Denise. Yeah, you're yeah, always, you. you're always yeah. so good on the Google. <laughs> you always save us. <laughs> and read her book because her book's fascinating too. Yeah. Okay, sorry, John, go ahead. Oh, she also gave a, a wonderful talk to Nature Guelph probably about seven or eight years ago. It was absolutely magnificent. I can't imagine what she'd be like with a couple of gin and tonics in her because I think she'd be on steroids. She was just great. That's a, a lovely, lovely woman. That it was. Well, thank you. So uh, for, for the Nature Guelph people, we're uh, heading out of lockdown finally. Um, we have nothing planned in outdoor activities, but um, as the COVID disappears and the province opens up, perhaps we will be able to do some very small outdoor events. So please uh, keep a watch on the Facebook page and our website. Denise, who just spoke, uh, does a fabulous job on Facebook and usually keeps us up to date. So perhaps we will all be able to meet again together. But if we don't, then uh, this is the end of our programming for uh, this season. You're on your own for the summer and we'll see you again in September. And Peter, if you are on the call, did you want to talk about some of the programming we'll be, we'll be having next year? You're talking to Peter Kelly, so, right? Peter Kelly, I don't know if he's still with us. Yeah, sure. We've got um, all the speakers booked, um, except two from September to May next year. We've got everything from Adam Schultz will be coming back. The Explorer Adam Schultz will be coming back. We have Chris Early is going to be coming. Um, we're doing Zoom talks for September to November and aiming for in-person talks from January to May. Um, I'm trying to think what else. We have a, a woman who does restoration to improve songbird habitat, a uh, professor at the university. We have a, uh, an author uh, and researcher who's studied the whole Asian carp um, introduction into the Great Lakes. Uh, we have a um, staff member at Point Pelee National Park who's going to be talking about turtles and turtles, restoring habitat for turtles. So we've got a bunch of things going on. It's, it's, it's exciting. Okay. Thanks, Peter. And I want to add too that uh, I, although I do post everything on social media, uh, I want to put one more plug in for people who uh, to become members of Nature Guelph. Uh, it's it's not much money. It's not hard to do. You can do it online on our website. And members, um, again, support us so that we can get you great programming like this. Um, but you'll also get um, emails directly to your inbox that tell you what we're up to. So you'll get personalized information about what we're up to and you don't, you don't have to worry about trying to go on our website or, or follow our socials, then you'll get the information right to you. Okay, right, right, thanks, Denise. So unless uh, I don't see any more questions, but I see many, many thank yous to uh, Peter for this presentation. So it was a great wind up to our season. So uh, goodbye to KW and uh, the Huron County and Gray County folks, and we'll see you again in September. So bye all.